Hello there. Welcome to my campfire. My name is Seraphine, the Midnight Bard, and it's my job to travel from place to place, seeking the strange, the bizarre, and the unexplained. A life of travel can be something that is thrilling and rewarding. The world is filled with places that vary from each other much in the same way that people do. No two are exactly alike, and each has its own personality. One should be wary, however, because for every vibrant and welcoming place, there are many others that are much less accommodating to visitors. If you feel your hair stand on end or that your blood runs cold, it would be wise to turn back the way you came because most of these places do not give more than one warning. Somewhere in America's heartland, a group of friends found one such place. Their experiences that night have left them wishing that they had never heard of the place known as Black Hollow. We were children, really. What did we know about anything? Sure, passionate, confident, and going to live forever. Be young forever. We didn't understand. How could we? Picture a group of kids somewhere between learning to drive and riding the high, beautiful cusp of early, not quite adulthood riding in a car which belongs to someone else's parents. No one inside, laughing, has any idea, no real idea, of insurance, loan payments, the tedium of never having enough to cover what's needed. On the radio is Elvis, The Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Iron Maiden, Nirvana, Slipknot, Five Finger Death Punch, Candle Mass, or Gorilla Riot. It doesn't matter. Kids cruising with the radio blasting is cross generational common ground. The only change is the music. We liked rock. Speeding down back roads, we hurried to nowhere, high on the camaraderie of imagined or inflated slights artificial oppression or assumed captivity, finding solidarity in our complaints, our suffering. We used pain as the mortar to cement our love for each other. Nothing belongs like belonging. I remember testing the wind resistance with my hand, skating my fingers on the currents like a coaster riding invisible tracks. Late summer afternoon heat baked down on the asphalt, radiating back again. If not for our speed, the humid air would have been stagnant and hard to breathe. As it was, it cooled the big Bonneville, tickling the sweat on our brows and tossling our hair. I didn't mind. It felt good being in this place with these people. We stopped at a gas station. We were hungry, thirsty. Good-natured arguments followed about who owed who how much and who bought what when. The arguing was bluster. Everyone departed the store with what they wanted. If someone was short, someone else stepped up. That's what friends do. Waiting by the car for the rest of the guys to finish paying, I sipped my Dr. Pepper and snacked on a Snickers. It could have been any group of friends anywhere in the country, but they were mine. Michael, athletic, good-looking, and a solid guy to have your back in a fight, or as a wingman out and about. Durrell, pronounced Durrell, like Mike, handsome, athletic, 
with the quickest wit of all of us, and that was saying something. Darrell wasn't a great wingman, as ladies tended to fight for his attention. But you could always count on him for a laugh. Riley had been part of our group since kindergarten. She always knew the best places to chill without crowds, and was also handy in a fight. Trey was like me. Thin, bookish, introverted, into video games. How we managed to fit in with the other three is a mystery. We all just clicked together. Content in our discontent, I suppose. When I think back, that's how I like to see them. Happy. Together. Whole. The summer sun surrounding them in a golden aura. Crossing the parking lot together, the four of them, drinking Dr. Peppers and laughing. Embraced by the fragile immortality of our youth. Riley suggested we head out for a little-known swimming hole, a place called the Deer Hole. Most people didn't go there because there were many other, more accessible places to swim which didn't require a hike through the mountains. We readily agreed. Riley knew the spots. Back in the car, we continued along backcountry roads. Crowded on either side by lush green, we climbed sun-dappled hills and dipped into shadowy valleys where the air temperature dropped pleasantly. We parked the car at a scenic overlook, part of the Appalachian Trail stretching 2,190 miles from Maine to Georgia. While there were a few people picnicking at an attached park and more posing in front of the vistas, we started walking on the trail. Riley saw something she'd been looking for. It was all trees and rocks to me, and took us onto a smaller game trail. As we put more distance between us and the crowds of granola heads on the trail, the woods became somber. Our conversation died. Each person unwilling to desecrate the holy silence with vulgar words. Like passing through a cemetery or crossing ancient battlegrounds, the woods felt sacred and we lowered our eyes to watch our feet, kept our mouths closed. We'd walked for close to an hour, keeping our thoughts to ourselves when Riley spoke. There we go. Three words broke the melancholy spell around us. I became aware of birds chirping and unseen animals rustling in the undergrowth. I heard water. Insects resumed their buzzing as we formed a small semicircle around Riley. She pointed to a winding path leading down to a deep blue pond. Roughly circular, it surfaced partly in the sun, partly beneath the shade of the surrounding trees. A switchback trail, flanked by a waterfall, twisted back and forth along the hillside. Beneath the waterfall, a thick rope once white, now weather-stained, knotted with handholds every foot, led to a small rock ledge twelve feet above the surface of the pond. Perfect for diving. The shadows began to grow long. Dark comes early in the mountains. I'd almost completely dried off. I like to swim, but the thought of all the dark water beneath me creeped me out. I couldn't shake the feeling of a rotten hand, flesh picked away in spots, or a tentacle perhaps, grabbing my ankle and dragging me to impossible depths to devour me underneath cold mountains. I left the water early while Mike and Darrell were challenging each other to increasingly difficult dives. After a time, the rest of the group made their way to the shoreline beside me. We laid on the bank, Mike and I to Riley's left, Darrell and Trey to her right. Off to my right, I heard the unmistakable gurgle of Trey's vape, or his douche flute, as we affectionately called it, followed by the sickly sweet smell of cotton candy. 
to this day, I cannot stand the scent. It makes me nauseous. The conversation turned to the inevitable search for something to do. As it was getting on in the afternoon, I wanted to go eat. Swimming always makes me hungry. In the end, dinner won out. <laughs> Swimming makes everyone hungry. There was a diner attached to the gas station we'd stopped at for snacks, and it wasn't far. A unanimous decision was achieved in record time to head back for burgers and discuss further plans. After we'd eaten, Full of cheeseburger, fries, and sweet tea, I leaned back in the booth, putting some distance between my plate and myself. Now no longer hungry, the smell of ketchup was making me feel ill. I've always been that way. The ketchup smells good at the start of a meal. Disgusting by the end. Riley smiled at me, as did Trey, both understanding. They knew me. Mike and Darrell continued eating, oblivious. Those two put away some food and were competitive about everything. Hey, what's the plan? Mike asked around a mouthful of bacon cheeseburger. You guys want to go somewhere scary? Trey asked. Instantly intrigued, we readily agreed. Trey shared a few details. The place is called Black Hollow. I think it's near where we went swimming, but I'll Google it to be sure. What's Black Hollow? Never heard of it. Riley asked wide-eyed. My uncle told me about it. He said the entire area is haunted. But there's a house way back in the hollow where it's really bad. Trey said. Mike and Darrell paused in their attempt to outgorge one another. Bad how? asked Darrell. Uncle said there are places in this world that are pure evil, and don't. Trey made quote marks in the air with his fingers. Abide human trespasses. Well, hell, Mike said. <laughs> now we have to go. Probably bullshit, said Darrell, picking at his fries. But I'm free. Let's do it. We'd been other haunted places. We'd gone to the haunted tracks where, according to the story, a school bus full of children were killed by a train. Whenever a car parked on the tracks, the ghosts of the children pushed the car clear. We dusted the bumper in the trunk with flour before stopping the car. Sure enough, the car rolled off the tracks and there were tiny handprints left behind. Another time, we went to an underpass rumored to be haunted, but the only thing happening there were boredom and cold. We'd been to haunted mansions and asylums. Once, Durrell received a nasty scratch on his back from an invisible assailant. The scratch was raw and puffy and took nearly a week to heal. We thought we'd seen some things. We were wrong. On the drive over, Trey gave us the few details he had. His uncle told him Black Hollow was built on an old Indian burial ground, and thus cursed. A quick Google search disproved this theory. Trey said the facts he discovered, and there were a few, pointed to tragedy. Disease, namely smallpox, wiped out most of the families living in the area around the turn of the 20th century. The remaining people were plagued with madness and unsolved murders. Details were sketchy, but Trey said the theory of cursed ground made as much sense to him as any. The Hollow got its name not from the infamous deeds committed there, but from a large family who settled in the area during the mid-1800s. Trey didn't find much on the Black family, where they were from, what happened to the survivors, or what they did for a living. 
the blacks were as much a mystery as the haunted ground they'd left as a legacy. Looking at the map on Trey's phone, it would have been faster to cut back to the deer hole, skirt the mountain, and end up near the back of Black Hollow. No one wanted to navigate the woods in the dark, and if those woods were haunted, it seemed better to have a quick means of escape ready. We followed spiderweb back roads. I won't give directions. Look it up yourself if you're curious. Around the mountain to our exit. A simple street sign, green and white like any other, read, Black Hollow. Mike turned the car onto Black Hollow Road. The pavement ran to gravel in less than half a mile. Mike slowed the car to a mellow 25 miles an hour. Tires crunched along contentedly. Lightning bugs were out. The fields surrounding us were filled with flashing greenish-yellow messages. The mountains on either side quickly moved in to squeeze our little road between them. Along with the lightning bugs, cicadas were out buzzing a droning song they'd waited 17 years underground to play. The evening would have been pleasant under other circumstances. We had the battlefield feeling again, like we were trespassers, interlopers, unwanted and uninvited guests to an exclusive gathering. My thighs were tight. My guts were fluttering. I wanted to leave. Tell Mike to turn around and get us the hell out of there. I couldn't embarrass myself in front of my friends. I wish I had. The gravel road dead-ended in front of an old, dilapidated two-story farmhouse. A front porch, once it might have been inviting, yawned mutely at us boards missing like rotten teeth. The front door hung on a single hinge, a failing sentinel between us and the darkness within. Mike circled around to point the car out, away from the house. Just in case, he said, leaving the keys hanging in the ignition. We stepped out into a yard overgrown with weeds. All was silent except for the cicadas. Uh, they were, if anything, louder without the engine noise and rocky crunch of grinding gravels. A small dust cloud, thrown by the tires, followed us, clinging to the car, the windshield, making me sneeze. The oppressive feeling of being watched, being hated, broke my skin out in goose flesh. Darrell pulled flashlights from the trunk, one for each of us, and I heard him exclaim, Oh shit, Mike, where'd you get this? Dad gave it to me last Friday. Careful, I've got a load of pumpkin balls. Which he pronounced, punkin. Riley, Trey and I walked around to the trunk to see what had Darrell so excited. Mike lifted a pump shotgun by the stock. Keeping the barrel pointed skyward, Mike dropped the weapon onto his shoulder, cool and casual. The weapon was black in the moonlight, sleek and deadly, leaning against Mike's shoulder like it had always been there. Why would we need that? Riley asked mirroring my own thoughts. The house was abandoned, despite my case of the willies. There wasn't even any trash in the yard, indicating a distinct lack of squatters. Might be snakes, Mike answered. He'd never taken a weapon with us before, and I didn't think we needed one now. Our safety lay in our numbers. We didn't split up. We stuck together going everywhere as a group. Riley rolled her eyes. She headed for the drunken door, leading the way as usual. Trey followed her, then me, with Darrell and Mike bringing up the rear. Riley lifted the door handle, and Trey put his shoulder into the wood and pushed. Together, they managed to get the door to scrape open. 
I noticed a large wasp nest. Its occupants, yellow and red striped, flitted their wings menacingly, but didn't take flight. Making my way across the uneven boards, I was grateful wasps were reluctant to fly in the dark. We gathered inside the threshold. A rectangle of moonlight illuminated a dusty wooden floor, hiding the rest of the space in darker shadow, if not for our flashlights. Five beams bobbed to and fro, cutting the black. A staircase to our left led to a hallway which overlooked the entranceway. What I assumed was a parlor room was to our right. Large picture windows overlooking the porch. And the wasp's nest, I thought. Above our heads, an old cast iron chandelier hung. A few of the holders still contained candles. I'd never seen a chandelier without electricity. The entranceway continued into the house, becoming a living room. The place seemed much larger on the inside. From the yard, I would have guessed 30 feet, maybe 40, and you'd be in the backyard. We'd covered that distance, and were standing just underneath the overlook. It didn't seem possible. I turned around, shining my light toward the open door. It appeared smaller, like we traveled further than our two dozen steps. If not for our flashlights, we wouldn't have been able to see anything. The interior was dark. A pair of French doors separated the living area from a kitchen. Darrell scraped the doors open, which groaned a dusty protest. Our footsteps echoed as there was no carpeting, almost no furniture at all. The walls were covered in silk wallpaper, which might have been striped yellow and white. It was faded and torn, peeling off the walls so I couldn't be sure. Every so often, an empty cast iron sconce mounted into the plaster, most without a candle. Along with the falling wallpaper, framed photos stared at us. Hundreds of old black and white photos of somber children, scowling men, and severe women marked our passing with disapproval. I wondered why there were so many photos with almost no furniture. Who lives like that? The condemning stares were almost too much to bear. Mike swung the shotgun back and forth, muzzle down, like he was trying to decide on a target. Beyond the French doors, our view of photography hall was mercifully blocked. The weight of the stairs lingered. Well, Riley said. That was creepy as fuck. The rest of us barked out much needed, tension relieving laughter. Where's all the furniture? Trey asked. Who decorates a house with creepy ass pictures? Darrell responded. A staircase in the kitchen led to the second floor. Another door hit a staircase to the basement. I didn't see a way out other than the way we'd come in. Up or down? I asked. Neither looked inviting. Up, Riley said. We went up on stairs which smelled like mildew and neglect. Paint had fallen off the wood, which had swollen and shrunk with moisture. The floor felt unsteady beneath our feet. At the apex, we found ourselves at the end of a long hallway, presumably the one which overlooked the entrance. A sharp, musky tang, like burned caramel, filled the air. Is it me, or is it like the house is growing? Riley asked. God, yeah, it seems bigger inside. Stinks too, Mike answered. How can a house grow? Trey asked, not being confrontational. He was scared. We all were. Trey was looking for a logical explanation for the illogical things we were experiencing. Listen, 
Terrell hissed. I heard it. A low drone, not dissimilar to the cicadas. Behind that first door. Mike nodded in the direction. Standing in a semicircle outside the door, our ears to the wood, listening to an insectile buzz growing in pitch, louder and pulsing as if aware of us. Oh, fuck it. Trey said, flinging the door open and rushing across the threshold. Trey began screaming immediately before his screen cut off in a choking wretch. Trey had stomped into a room nearly consumed by a yellow jacket nest, throwing the door open, ripped into their papery domain. The wasps exploded into action, instantly covering Trey in their stinging, pulsing bodies. Somehow, he managed to turn and slap the door closed, cutting us off from the fury of the swarm, trapping himself inside. Hundreds of angry wasps made it into the hallway before Trey slammed the door. The air filled with angry insects. Darrell knocked me against the wall as he ran past, slapping at his head. Mike, Riley, and I followed, panicked, desperate to escape. We thundered down the stairs, pursued by the stinging mob. They were in my hair, stinging my scalp, on my clothes. Following my friends, unaware Trey was still upstairs, I banged my hip on a counter. In my frenzy, I hardly noticed. Darrell missed the French doors, running instead into the basement. Mike, Riley, and I followed. Shut the door! Shut the door! Mike screamed. I jerked it closed behind me, distantly aware of the sound of yellow jackets hitting the other side of the door. Downstairs, in the dark, we slapped and crushed anything crawling on us. For several minutes, the only sounds were Riley's crying, our moaning, and the slapping of hands followed by the stomping of feet. Eventually, the angry bus died off, leaving us alone with our pain. I'd managed to hang on to my flashlight. Riley still held hers. Trey? I asked. Um, upstairs. Riley said, choking off a sob. She sounded strange. Her lips and eyes swelled into cartoonish proportions. My left eye had already swollen almost completely shut. We need to go get him, Mike said. How? Darrell answered. We have to try, Riley said. If Trey hadn't shut the door, we'd be dead too. Trey saved us, I said. They were all over him, every inch. And no way he survived. The relative few escapees nearly killed the four of us. We have to go get help. Silence and nods greeted my statement. None of us liked admitting it. But Trey was likely dead. We needed help to recover his body. Looking around the basement for another exit beside the one to the kitchen, ground floor windows covered with grime stared at nothing, refusing to budge. Otherwise, the basement stood as empty as much of the house, the exception being a baby's wooden cradle against the back wall. Darrell approached the cradle. Riley gave him her light, which he used to peer cautiously inside. All we need is another damn swarm, Darrell said. No, it's empty, we're good. Darrell turned away. The cradle began to rock. The awful, metallic cicada drone increased in intensity. Riley pointed at the rocking cradle and shouted a warning. That was lost to the insectile buzz. I felt it vibrating in my chest. Forming a thought was difficult. From my angle, I couldn't see what came out of the cradle. I saw Darrell drop to his knees as something chewed on his neck. Mike squeezed the trigger on the shotgun, racked a fresh shell, and fired again. The roar of the blast was swallowed in the cacophony. 
Flames leaped from the barrel, and again as Mike fired upon the thing on Darrell's back. He missed his mark and the cradle disintegrated. Blood splattered onto the wall. Darrell dropped face first onto the ground, his neck chewed through. Whatever was chewing on him shrieked, vanishing at the cradle's destruction. Mike grabbed me and shouted, Come on, we have to go! Riley was running up the stairs, back into the kitchen. I stumbled after Mike who had dragged me into the kitchen. The terrible noise intensified, vibrating my teeth, causing my nose to bleed. Riley ran toward the entrance. Mike followed and I staggered along behind. The photos on the wall were blank. Their occupants stood to either side of the hall watching us run. We ran that impossible gauntlet trying not to look left or right. All the while, the noise got louder. I was having trouble moving. My bones shook. Riley reached the porch where she turned and pointed. Mike dragged me along by the collar. Throwing me outside, he turned to fire at whatever Riley was pointing at. I stood up. Mike braced himself in the doorway, firing round after round into the black. A shadow on the overlook moved towards the stairs. The pumpkin ball shattered the railing, tore large, dusty hunks from the wall behind and through the figure. It continued down the stairs, floating, moving as if on rails, even closer. Mike's shotgun clicked empty as it reached toward him. Mike kept himself between it, Riley, and me. It grabbed him around the throat, pulling him back inside. I saw through its hand. Mike's flesh smoked and blistered beneath its shadowy touch. Run. Mike croaked as his head burst into flame. We ran. I barely managed to get into the passenger door before Riley slammed the car into drive. The insectile drone vibrated the mirrors, but I still saw Mike's flaming body being drug upstairs. A large black hand filled the doorway, reaching for us. Go! Go, Riley! Drive! She didn't need any encouragement. Stomping on the gas, accelerating away from the house, the hand continued reaching for us. As it cleared the porch, it burst into flame, reaching, beckoning as we sped away. Once back on the main road, Riley pulled over and we sat there and held each other and cried. No one would believe what we saw, what we did. There are places on this earth, inhabited by evil not of this world, which brooks no trespassing. Evil exists. I swear, every word is true.